<laughs> so, um, so yeah, I actually wanted to talk about sex determination across the animal kingdom for, for three reasons. Right? The first reason is that um, there end up being a lot of really interesting genetic mechanisms that have to do with sex determination. So sex determination is a really good teaching tool for a lot of different genetic phenomena. And the second reason is that it is hugely variable, which makes it super interesting to see how different organisms, how different species um, determine sex. And the third reason is because I, I studied an, an organism that had an interesting sex determination system that wasn't really studied, but, um, but uh, it's something that has sort of interested me because of that. So I find it very intrinsically interesting. So, um, notice how I said the animal kingdom is not all of life everywhere, right? So here you see this genetic tree of life, and there are lots of different kingdoms of life, and I'm only going to talk about animals today. Um, but just know that for how interesting and weird animals are, <laughs> the rest of the kingdoms are just as weird, if not weirder. So, um, I'm only going to talk about three, uh, uh, just kidding, five examples of uh, sex determination systems in animals today. And the first one is Homo sapiens, or humans. <laughs> David is our, our exemplar oh my gosh. Uh, individual of this, um, of this species. And then um, we're actually going to shift gears uh, not to another mammal, even though we'll, we'll be talking about another mammal, but um, an insect, the Sophila melanogaster, which is a fruit fly. It's a common model organism. And the reason for this is those two sex determination systems um, have some interesting things in common and some interesting distinctions. So I wanted to pair them together. Then we'll shift gears and go back up to mammals and we'll talk about uh, the duck-billed platypus, um, which is yeah, pretty awesome. That is exactly the reaction you should have to duck-billed platypuses in general. Um, and then, uh, we will step out, um, zoom out of mammals, and zoom in on uh, another vertebrate, uh, a frog, the African clawed frog, Xenopsis latus. And then finally, we'll go back to insects and talk about Solenopsis geminata, which is the tropical fire ant, which you would find right outside the classroom. So, um, let's go ahead and start with Homo sapiens. So, uh, the way sex determination works in humans is actually the same way it works in all other therian mammals. So therian mammals are both placental mammals and marsupials, right? So the only mammals that aren't therian mammals are monotremes, right? So duckbill platypus, and then uh, I think two species of echidna in Australia are, are monotremes, they're not therian. So um, the way it works in humans and all other therian mammals is that there is an X chromosome, and a Y chromosome. Therian is T H E R. Yeah, placental and marsupial, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, sorry. Yeah. So placentals are called eutherians and marsupials are therians. Um, so it's all about the, the X and Y chromosome. So, <laughs> um, and specifically on the Y chromosome, there is this gene called SRY. SRY stands for uh, the sex determining region Y. And basically, the SRY gene is a master switch for maleness. All right, like the marker runs out. I already kind of tested the marker, and I want it to just come upside down. I can hold it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my job. I feel important. <laughs> so again, the SRY gene activates male-specific transcription factors, and these transcription factors are everywhere in the genome. Right? They're on autosomes, they're on sex chromosomes. So it's not like this tiny little degenerate Y chromosome has everything that defines males. It in fact has almost no genes except for the SRY gene. So basically the only really functional gene on the Y chromosome is SRY. And that turns on all of these other genes and starts this male pathway. So it's kind of like the default is female. Exactly. It's kind of like the default is female. The better. <laughs> we'll see that in a second. Is that why men have nipples? <laughs> yeah, right? That's what I want to know. <laughs> it's going to be a long talk. <laughs> that, yeah, I'll save that for a different talk, I guess. Next guest lecture will be why do men have nipples? If you gave that, if you gave that in a university, I'm sure that you would have the biggest turnout. <laughs> Seriously. I just read a book that had that as the chapter title. Um, 
So anyway, uh, so yeah, imagine this, right? So males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and females have a Y chromosome and a Y chromosome. And unlike the Y chromosome, an X chromosome has, the, I, I meant to do it. Yeah, sorry, I said something different. Um, uh, the, unlike the Y chromosome, the X chromosome has tons of genes, right? It has about 2,000 genes, and most of those genes have nothing to do with sex determination, right? So they're essential to being a human being, regardless of being male or female. Um, and this poses an interesting problem, right? Because now you have females, and they have twice as much gene product for all of these genes being made as males, right? So it's this issue of dosage, right? The titer, the concentration of all these gene products would be different between females and males. And that's like a disaster, right? That would be a terrible problem. So this is this, there's this issue of dosage, right? And it turns out that different organisms that have chromosomal sex determination use different ways to resolve this dosage issue, and it's called dosage compensation. Okay, Mark, this is dumb, but I, I don't understand why the Y chromosome has to be this. So, so you have this SRY region. Why can't you then have you know, all the rest? All the interesting things? Yeah. Well, it turns out that it's a, it's a common syndrome of sex determination genes to sort of end up having all of these inversions. And then the inversions make recombination really hard to happen, so it starts accumulating all, these, all of these mutations. And it basically is this pathway to becoming a degenerate, mm -hmm. terrible chromosome that only has like one gene. So the solution is just to, to have the, the SRY or and nothing else on the male determining. <laughs> Uh, I mean, solution might be an interesting way of phrasing it because a lot of times you'll see turnover of sex chromosomes, right? When, when, the, when the Y gets exhausted, in a sense, in other systems you've seen the sex, uh, the sex determining gene jump to a different chromosome, so you see a lot of turnover of sex chromosomes. Does that, does that sort of answer your question? By dosage, do you mean abosufficiency? Is that... Uh, do I mean abosufficiency? Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. yeah. Um, Just sure. shows concepts. Is, since they have a double dose, you have to find some way to inactivate them. Exactly. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yes. Right. So, yeah, Marley has twice as many genes, just Marley, <laughs> you know, of a, of a certain, of proteins of a certain gene on her X chromosome as you do. Mm -hmm. So if if you didn't figure out a way to deal with that, right? Oh, if you yeah. didn't figure out a way, if Marley didn't figure out a way to inactivate her second X chromosome, which is what we see happening, right? So X inactivation is, is what solves the dosage compensation problem. So X inactivation is super fascinating. Um, the marker you gave it to her. Um, and basically what happens is that, let's say you have a female zygote, right? So this is the first cell. This is, this is the cell that starts an individual, right? And this individual happens to be female, right? They have two X chromosomes. So what needs to happen is one of those X chromosomes needs to be shut off in all of the cells in a female's body, right? Um, so it turns out that in placental mammals, not in marsupials, but in placental mammals, this doesn't happen until the blastula stage when there are a lot of cells, right? So this zygote has undergone mitosis a bunch, so now you have a bunch of cells, and these are all stem cells. Stem cells. And it isn't until this stage that um, the X chromosomes start being inactivated. And at every single one of these cells in the blastula, it's random which X chromosome gets turned off. Again, this is in placental mammals. It's not true in marsupials. It's not random. Um, right, so it's just kind of randomly decided. And feel free to ask questions, guys, if you've got if you've got questions about things. No, we're just are you on. sure you're going to regret the same? So, <laughs> so, wait, so, so, uh, so the reason X needs to be inactivated is it's really it's the sex determining region that needs to be inactivated, right? 
or no, or right? So all that has to happen is that males and females have to be expressed in the same levels. We'll get to it in a okay. second, but okay. Drosophila okay. doesn't have an X in, X in okay. activation. They actually turn up their X uh, in the males. They go the right? other way. Exactly. Okay. So, Marley. So is X, X in activation just that of that second chromosome, like dying? <laughs> it doesn't. It just gets prevented from expressing its gene, right? And we'll actually see how that happens in just a second. Um, so it's just it's, it's shut down, right? So my erasing it, I'm not actually it's not actually being like deleted right, right. from those cells. It's just being like compressed and, and made hard to turn on genes. So, uh, but the point here is that it's random and it's different between these different cells, right? So this cell has X2 turned on and X1 turned off, and this cell would have X1 turned on and X2 turned off. Does that make sense? Okay. So what you end up happen what ends up happening is that these stem cells end up becoming different lineages of cells in a body, right? So this stem cell starts producing, you know, muscle cells or heart cells or different parts of the skin, and this stem cell produces another part of the body, right? So you end up having this mosaic of an individual who has actually different genotypes at her X chromosome depending on which cell you're looking at in her body. That makes sense? Yes. Okay. So like the classic example of this is a calico cat. Right? So the, the idea here would be, let's say we have, thank you for getting marker if you did that. <clears throat> let's say we have that scenario, right? Where we have these two X chromosomes, and it turns out that fur color in some mammals is on the X chromosome. So let's say on this on this X chromosome, the fur color allele is black, right? And on this X chromosome, the fur color allele is orange, okay? So that means that after X inactivation happens, some of those stem cells are going to only be expressing the X orange allele, and others of those cells are only going to be express expressing the X black alleles, right? So you'll have these pockets of cells that'll be on for the X uh, chromosome that has the black allele, and other ones for the X chromosome that has the X orange allele. So, so that means that if you see a cat and it's calico, you know something really interesting about that cat. What do you know? Two different X types. Like well, yeah. So, so how many X chromosomes does it have? It has to be female. It has to be female. Exactly. Right. So calico cats are female. You know just by looking at them, you don't have to like look at anything else, you just have to know that it's female. Turns out that's not always the case. I lied to you. So yeah. it's very, very rare, but you have male calico cats. How can that happen? Never. Two X chromosomes and a Y. Exactly. So every once in a while, during meiosis, right, there's some kind of mistake, right? There's a non-disjunction event. I don't know if you guys have learned yep. about that. But basically, one of, the, one of the gametes ends up having an extra sex chromosome that then gives to the offspring, right? So this offspring has three sex chromosomes, two of which happen to be X and one of which happens to be Y. So this individual, male or female? Male. Male, right? Y. Technically, they have the Y chromosome to the S or Y area right. activated. Right, so it's got the SRY gene, and it's a mammal, so that means it's male. Um, but it also has two X's, so one of the X's have to, has to be inactivated. So uh, it, you see this calico phenotype, right? So very rarely you'll find calico males, too, but almost always you'll find Okay, Mark, males. call me a dope, but I'm still missing something. So we have two copies of every gene. and Except right? for SRY. Except for SRY, exactly. Right, but one of them's not being expressed in all cells. In all, yeah, but but in in all the other chromosomes, we have basically two copies. We don't have to downregulate or right one versus right. Those. So the dosage problem isn't that there's too much mm -hmm. in females or that there's too little in males. The it's problem is it's not the, the same. And, right? it, and why does it have to be the same? Just because there's a lot of really important things that don't have to do with sex, right? That you wouldn't want expressed at one level in males and not in females. Okay. I mean, you, you, you could imagine maybe another way of solving the problem is putting on the Y chromosome something that 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 ramps up, you know. Right, right. X, right. Does, does that, does that but what are those things that have to be equal? 
I have no. I mean, there's just tons of genes on, on the X chromosome. There's that don't have to do with sex. Right. That there's some two thousand things. Actually, yeah. I, while I was doing research, I found a page that has a list of genes on the X chromosome, and I could share that with you if you want. Okay. But it's, there's okay. a lot of stuff going okay. on. Okay. Um, Marley. Okay. So, so does that mean that when with X inactivation, that only parts of an X chromosome? Is is like shut down because wouldn't I mean wouldn't we all be wouldn't all women be like somehow multicolored in a way or like <laughs> have different if there's two like if oh, if it's just random what shuts down and what doesn't? Well, okay. So the, the 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 deal here and the reason why we don't see calico people right is because fur color, or skin color, or whatever doesn't happen to be on the X chromosome for humans. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. But you are chimeric for something, right? Like what? I don't know, some gene on the X chromosome. I think, you know, how it is. I think it, like, it doesn't okay. like completely, but I think hair color does. Stuff. So what, like having some hairs that are blonder and some that are less blonde? Is that an example, or is that just... That might be something else. It's Actually, I was watching a video about this, and one thing they do say is uh, sweat glands, right? So you'll find some people, if there's like a deletion for some kind of sweat gland, and they're heter uh, heterozygous for that deletion, right? So if one of the X chromosomes that they have is female, as a deletion for sweat glands and the other one has it, you find women who have on parts of their body, they're missing sweat glands, and on other parts of their body, they have sweat glands. Hmm. And these are humans. Hmm. Hmm. The most traits are polygenic, meaning multiple genes. So there's only 2,000 on X chromosome. So the chances of one gene contributing to one trait significantly right. is not very high. So something like hair color, like, you know, we're used to thinking about hair color, eye color as being these, like, single gene traits. None of them are, right? They're determined by tons of different genes. Right, like, no one has, like, the exact same color blue eye and stuff like that. Right, right. Okay. So are you satisfied with that? Yeah, I don't know why I was, like, mixing the two concepts. Okay. Probably my fault. Right, so, um, yeah, so X inactivation is the way to sort of solve this, this, this dosage difference problem. Um, and questions about X inactivation? Um, well, too bad. You're getting more, <laughs> you're getting more anyway. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the actual mechanism. So we've talked about how X inactivation works, but we haven't talked about like the genes involved in it and what, what is actually causing... I just lose my marker all the time. There's a whole pack. Thank you. Um, so before we talk about like the genes involved and stuff, it turns out that I have to explain <laughs> uh, heterochromatin and euchromatin. Have you guys learned about heterochromatin and euchromatin? Okay, so I'll be really brief about it. Heterochromatin basically is chromatin, right? So genetic information that's tied up really, really tight. And euchromatin is uh, chromatin that isn't tied up really tight. So so, right, imagine this. Imagine that you have literally meters of DNA in every single one of your cells in your body, right? And you have to, you can't fit all that DNA totally unraveled in your body in each of your cells. This is not going to work. So you have to tie it up, and you have to take that tied up stuff and tie it up, and you have to take that tied up stuff and tie it up, right? So you just have to keep tying it up really, really tight, with just, just like levels and levels. It's like inception for cells. And um, the first first layer of that is uh, chromatin gets wrapped around these proteins called histones. Okay. And um, depending on different modifications to histones, they can be more tightly wrapped or not. Um, but the main, the main point here is that if it's not, like in order to be expressed, in order for a gene to be made into a protein product, it has to be accessed by transcription machinery. It has to be transcribed, right? So RNA polymerase has to fit in all these other proteins that do things to DNA to help RNA polymerize, or to help RNA polymerase do its thing to make messenger RNA. Um, they have to actually be able to physically fit in, right? And if the DNA is so tightly wound, um, it's never going to, the transcriptional machinery is never going to be able to access the DNA, right? So what you end up having to do is constantly unwind and expose as euchromatin DNA, and then again, when you don't need it, sort of rewind it again into heterochromatin. So it turns out that with that inactivated X chromosome, 
that's what's happening. That, that extra X chromosome is being turned into an entire chromosome of heterochromatin. Right? And the way that's being done is with this gene called exist. So, um, yeah, they're really clever with some of their, um, with some of their gene names. So, exist ends up actually not coding for a gene product. It ends up coding just for non-coding RNA. Right? So the final product of this gene is just RNA. Okay, the RNA, and it's sort of unclear how this happens exactly, but, um, or at least it's unclear to me how this happens exactly, uh, it accumulates around one of the two X chromosomes, right? So it's probably some sort of like self-organization. Maybe there's like slight, just random variations in the beginning and they kind of, they kind of uh, feed back on each other, right? But what ends up happening is the excess RNA ends up accumulating around one of the X chromosomes and it recruits chromatin modeling or machinery to the X chromosome to then turn it all into heterochromatin. Meanwhile, and fascinatingly, on the other X chromosome, the one that's not going to get turned off, it's expressing RNA from this other gene called T6, which is just literally X exist written in reverse. Um, and it is the complement to exist RNA. Okay, have you learned about X, uh, RNA interference? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, so this is cool, right? Because now you have RNA on this side that's the complement to exist. So even if there is any exist accumulating on this chromosome, T6 is going to bind to it, and now it's going to be double-stranded RNA, which is going to target it for a degradation gotcha. in the RNA interference and for people who are really curious about RNA interference, I'll send you a video. It's like the coolest thing. Like the, the, the team that discovered it got the Nobel Prize in 2006. Like it's awesome. It's like it's been sort of hijacked by people as a way to turn off genes, right? So it's like a really, really powerful way to turn off genes. It's called RNA interference, RNAi. But anyway, it's so cool, right? Because the sex determination pathway and dosage compensation in human beings, arguably the most boring of sex determination pathways, uses RNAi in the pathway, which I think is just so cool. So there you go. That's, um, that's how X inactivation works in humans. OK, so at this point, I thought it'd be fun to have a nice little discussion about, um, about sex in, in humans, that is to say, like gender. Um, and uh, it turns out that it's not always as clear cut as it should be in human beings. Um, and uh, this is apparent in many different uh, fields of human enterprise, but perhaps most saliently among Olympians, right? So uh, in like the mid-1980s, uh, <laughs> the International Olympic Committee started getting a lot of these protests about some of the Eastern Bloc women who people thought maybe they're not women. So, you know, that would be kind of a bizarre advantage to have if you're competing as a woman and you're not actually a woman, right? Because men and women, you know, males and female, male and female humans have different levels of testosterone, right? There's variation, right? But the distributions just don't even overlap. So um, it, it's, it's in fact an unfair advantage to be, to be competing, right? To be masquerading as, as a, a, a woman if you're a man, right? So they started doing these tests and um, testing for whether you were in fact a woman or not. Um, and initially these tests were kind of crude and humiliating and you'd have teams of doctors inspecting genitalia and it was just terrible, right? But eventually, as the age of genetics and genomics sort of caught on, this is again in the, in the, in the 80s, they started taking cheek, cheek swabs. So just tissue from, from people's cheeks. And they started finding female athletes who were XY. And these female athletes were like, you know what? I'm not lying to you. I'm legit a female. You know, I'm not making this up. I'm not masquerading as anything. Like, this is, this is who I am. And they were like, okay, well, what's going on here? So I submit that question to you guys. Why on earth would you have somebody be biologically female who's XY, who has this XY genotype? The sorry gene was active. Yeah, right? So you could have something like a deletion of the SRY gene, right? So 
maybe that gene, that master switch for maleness, never got turned on. So even though that individual has a Y chromosome, the male pathway never happened, right? So they became female. Okay, so... But does that change the testosterone levels? It shouldn't, right? If they're female, they're female. I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't affect performance. Well, it's testosterone levels will affect performance. Yes, and yes sex, I know they will, sex but... sex-specific genes, right? That the, if the male pathway is activated, it's going to turn up genes that affect... Right, but if the male pathway is not activated, right. then... Does right, it... so yeah, exactly. So if they have a deletion of SRY, like the Olympic Committee was like, go ahead and compete as a woman. You're, okay. Yeah, that's fine, right? But here's an example. Um, this woman, her name is Maria Jose Martinez Patino, and she is a really famous uh, Olympic hurdler from Spain, and she competed in the 80s. Um, and they tested her for XY, and, um, and she, I mean, they tested her, her uh, they did sex tests on her, and they found that she was XY, and they found that she had a functioning SRY gene, and yet she was not male, right? She was not biologically male. So what else could be happening here? Somehow both XX and XY. So yeah, that's a, um, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's a really good point, right? You could be chimeric, right? You could have, let's say there were two zygotes, right? There were fraternal twins, one was a male, one was a female, and they got fused really early on in embryogenesis, and they became one human being that had different cell lineages that were female and different cell lineages that were male. That's legit, right? That could happen, and in fact does happen, um, but that actually isn't the case for Maria Jose Martinez. But once again, if you were female like that, you shouldn't have higher levels of testosterone. And I suppose it depends on whether your male cells are in your muscles or not, and things like that. Did this happen a lot but when the, they were testing? Yeah, so probably like the Olympics is enriched for a lot of these interesting... Huh. Genetic yeah. Yeah. Huh. So was her SRY gene it was activated, but not at levels of switch uh, homozygous or homozygous haplosufficiency? So that's a good, um, that's a good guess, but that's not the case. I'll give you the answer. <laughs> um, so the case for her was that she had a different mutation entirely that made her insensitive to testosterone. So she had complete testosterone insensitivity. So even though her genetics were saying, turn on all these male things, some, somewhere along the line, you know, you need testosterone to turn on even more of these genes, and her body just wasn't, she didn't have the right receptors or whatever, something happened where she just couldn't um, uh, react to the testosterone, right? So she has male levels of testosterone circulating in her system, but she can't respond to any of it. So in a sense, she's even at a worse disadvantage because Females, you know, have levels of testosterone, not at the same, you know, magnitude as males, but they do, right? And she can't use any of it. So um, when they found this out about her, they, you know, reinstated all of her titles and everything. And, but for a while there, you know, it kind of ruined her life. So just bear that in mind, right? But the way of defining... Her, her condition, though, is conferring on her an athletic advantage as a woman or... or no, it's no, not. It's conferring a disadvantage, right? She can't use any testosterone whatsoever. Oh, yeah. But she's still an Olympian. Yeah, that's Pretty really cool, interesting. Huh? What so, makes it so, like, rich in that, like, the Olympians? Why are there so many that test that way? Especially her, if she had a disadvantage. Is it just, like, coincidence? I think for her, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a really rare thing. <laughs> um, yeah. If you're in the Olympics, it. you're not really yeah, average. Typical anything. <laughs> but you know, for, other, for other athletes, especially female athletes, you know, if, if you have some, if you're chimeric, right, or if you have, a, um, I don't know, a translocation of the SRY gene or, or something like that, right, then you're making male levels of testosterone, and that's a huge advantage. So, so, you so is her body normal? Cases. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, is, is her body normal? Yeah. <laughs> um, is she, I mean, is she, so is she when she they fertile? inspected her, yeah, is she they fertile? found, that's a good question, I don't know whether she had kids, but they found that she had testes. But they were internalized. Um, so, but so she also has ovaries, or no? Those I are only glands. You know she didn't have ovaries. You're right. Uh, yeah. So she can't have babies. Um, she can't have babies. Okay. So yeah, it, the, you know the rabbit hole always gets a little. But you deeper. think it's just a coincidence that she was an Olympian? 
I don't know because they the Olympic Committee now they they test for and you know they see a lot of complete testosterone sensitivity right so it's not just her which sort of I is interesting. Say that, uh, it's far more common than it's genuinely realized. So so there is some advantage there. We just don't some physiology. It's not testosterone. Can, levels, it's right? not so testosterone yeah. which you would associate with all this athletic performance. Right. Wouldn't I mean, the inability to use testosterone result in like catastrophic problems for a person though? You would think, but she's totally fine. I mean, she made it to the Olympics. She may have a risk mutation that allows partial sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So remember, it's like balancing out. Yeah, remember we talked about the polygenic traits just a minute ago. Yeah. But she also doesn't I identify with the op She doesn't have a gender mm -mm. mismatch. Mm -mm. She something. had no idea. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Her like fiance left her when all this stuff happened. Oh. It's like, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she's like now celebrated, so that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, that's sex determination in human beings. So let's shift gears a little bit to uh, to a different system. This is Drosophila melanogaster. Um, so again, this is the fruit fly, really common model insect. Um, used a lot in genetics. <laughs> and in Drosophila melanogaster, in contrast to, to Homo sapiens, it's all about the ratio of X to A, right? So they still have XY, chromosomal sex determination. But in this case, it's the ratio of the number of X chromosomes you have to to autosomes that matters, right? So females which have typically two X chromosomes, right? And two of every autosomal chromosome. That ratio is one, two over two. Means they're female, right? But if they have one fewer X chromosome than they have autosomes, right? So if they're XY, so they've only got one X and they've got two autosomes, that ratio is 0.5, that means they're male, okay? So the way this works, the mechanism that actually is behind this is a chromosome counting sort of phenomenon. So there is a master switch in Drosophila melanogaster, and that is called, what's it called? SXL, the female uh, master switch, right? And uh, what happens is that on the X chromosome and on autosomes, there are all these transcription factors that sort of turn on SXL or turn it off. Okay, so, um, if you have one X chromosome, right, so if you're male, you have, am I getting this wrong? Okay, yeah, so it, if you have one X chromosome in males, there are transcription factors on that X chromosome that say, go ahead and turn on SXL. The autosomes, there are ones that say, turn it off, turn it off, or cancel out this transcription factor, right? Such that it breaks about even in males, okay? So SXL never gets turned on. So the female pathway never happens. So in Drosophila, the default is male, right? So Drosophila probably don't have nipples. Um, so, uh, that's important. Vestigial <laughs> other things. Vestigial <laughs> <laughs> something else. Exactly, the females. Um, but, uh, um, whereas in females, when so they have two X chromosomes, right? They have extra doses, think about it, of the transcription factors that upregulate SXL, such that they don't break even, they have an abundance, right? The, the XXL upregulators out titrate the downregulators in females, because they've got two, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that pathway switches on, SXL switches on, and all the female stuff switches on. Okay, so, and just as a side note, do dosage compensation still has to happen in, in Drosophila melanogaster, right? They still have to deal with the fact that females have two X chromosomes and males only have one. And the way they compensate is upregulating the, the X chromosome in males, right? Instead of, instead of turning off the so, dosage compensation, pretty crazy, man. <laughs> um, why didn't that work? Okay, so this is a little quiz here. <laughs> so we have Homo sapiens, and we have Drosophila melanogaster, and we have all of these different genotypes, okay? And I want you to tell me what sex of the individual this would be. So, so for XY, what would be the sex of a Homo sapiens individual? XY? Yeah. Yeah. 
assuming no like bizarre translocations or mutations or anything like that. What about intracellular malaria? Yeah. yeah. What about XX for Homo sapiens? Female. Right, female. The better sex. <laughs> the default. Um, what about for Drosophila melanogaster? Female. Yeah. Okay. And then here's where it gets kind of interesting, right? So this is XO is an individual who, through again some weird non disjunction event or something, didn't get a sex chromosome from, from one of its parents, right? So it's X and it got nothing else. Right, so it's just got one X chromosome. So for Homo sapiens, female. Yeah. this individual will be female. It's called Turner syndrome. It's called Turner syndrome. Okay. Um, for Drosophila melanogaster, male. Yeah. It's male. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Because it's the default. No, because there's only one X. Why do you have to be don't have the Y? Right. So, so this ratio stays the same. The X chromosome upregulate SXL doesn't out titrate anything, right? Because there's not that extra X. So, default male pathway. Okay, XXY, which is Kleinfelters in human beings. Male. Yep. And what about the top one leg? Female. It's female, right? Again, because this ratio, X to autosome, is one. Okay, so that's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Weird. So Kleinfelters and Turners are different in Drosophila than they would be in. So is Turner specifically to females? That's not. Yeah. Yes. So you would never have a male that has Turner. Right, right. right? Okay. And you would never have a female that has Kleinfelters. So what are the symptoms of Turner? Yeah. Like, yeah, and it's interesting that there are symptoms, right? Isn't that weird? Because X inactivation turns off one of the X's anyway. So, go ahead, sorry. Well, I'm going to skim the if you want to. Well, I mean, yeah, feel free to correct me, but I think it's that. Um, X inactivation isn't always complete, right? So um, there is a little bit of leakage of expression of that extra X chromosome. So there are differences. But mm -hmm. I have a characteristic left neck uh, shield shaped chest. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, uh, multiple retardation. Really? Mm -hmm. It's significant. Because you're over. Yeah, I mean, you can, t you know how, like, yeah. You can tell looking at somebody like that person might have turners or climb or something. There's like really strong phenotypic differences. Uh, by X and activation, we are inactivating half of the cells in the body and having any of those two thousands. So is it like phys are there like physical disabilities too? Oh yes. Physical, mental, developmental. Wow. Um, any type of I thought it was more true of addition than loss. Like, can you sometimes be missing an extra copy? Mm -hmm. you? Yeah, well, no, if you're missing, you typically die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you the survive. Smaller ones, if you have an extra one, uh, the most common one outside of Klein filter, try some which is Down syndrome. Right. So, how, do, how is it then that people who are born with Turner's don't? Die. They're not missing a chromosome, they're just, well, it just happens. Yeah, actually, if you, with mm -hmm. X inactivation, mm -hmm. it's only, the, the whole pathway X inactivation only happens if there is more than one, right? So if they have one, it's not like it turns off, right? right. So even in the cells that have an X chromosome, mm -hmm. it keeps that one X chromosome turned on. Oh. But, but, Good you question. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I think I'm all right. Good job, guys. Um, so let's move on from Drosophila melanogaster and talk now about about um, back to mammals. So this again is a non-therian mammal. This is a monotreme, and again, duckbill platypuses have just they're just the exception to every rule, and sex <laughs> determination is, is no different. And they lay eggs, right? They lay eggs. They have weird venom spikes on their feet. They have all kinds of really interesting non-mammal things. <laughs> they, what? they make duck face all the time. They make duck face all the time. So just humans and black. 
Um, so, <laughs> so it turns out that the Vepoponipus has multiple sex chromosomes. So it's not just one X and one Y, it's actually five X's and five Y's. So this means that males have 10 unpaired chromosomes, right? X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, X5. And females have just those five pairs, X1 with X1, X2 with X2, X3 with X2, with X3, etc. Okay, not only that, but that master switch, remember SRY for all, for all the other mammals? It doesn't exist in Ducktopodipus. They just don't have it. Safe way. It's gone. Right? So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Really fun. Okay, so um, there's not even there's no orthologue for SRY. Why? So clearly they're using something else as the master switch, if there's even a master switch. So they looked for things that were even closely related to SRY, and they found this gene SOX3, and then they realized it was in an autosome. So, so that's that's not it, or that's bizarre. Something, something really weird is going on, right? And actually, all of this has been described uh, as recently as 2004 was when they started doing this. So, so the jury is still out um, in terms of like the master switch and a lot of the a lot of the genetics involved in the sex determination. But they do know about these weird chromosomes and that they have these. The males have these ten unpaired chromosomes. So just to explain that a little better. What we're looking at here are karyotypes of two different individuals. These are both ductile platypi, platypuses, something, I don't know, Latin. Um, and uh, so karyotypes, basically, a researcher fixes a cell at a certain stage in mitosis and stains chromosomes and takes a picture of them under a microscope, and this is what you get, right? And this is one individual, and this is the other individual. And you can see that for 21 of the chromosomes, um, they're, they're the same. So those are autosomes, right? But then there are all these funky E, e, e chromosomes, right? And in this individual, there's an E1 and an E2, and E3, and E4, and E5, and E6. And sometimes they're different sizes, right? And in this individual, they only have E1, E3, E5, E7, and E9. So which one is the female? Bottom. Why? Because they're paired. Right, exactly. Right. So you could basically think of these as the five X chromosomes, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And you could think of this as X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Does that make sense? So this is the male and this is the female. So the male has ten unpaired sex chromosomes and the female has five paired. With me? Okay, so we're like more than halfway. So, okay, the next one is an amphibian. This is Xenopus latus, and I picked an amphibian instead of a bird because I know that you're a herpetology fan. Um, so this is a uh, African clawed frog, and an interesting story about African clawed frogs. Not only are they also a model organism, but they were frequently used as <laughs> pregnancy tests back in the day. So a woman who thought she was pregnant could inject her urine into one of these female frogs. And if that frog ovulated, they would know that they were pregnant. <laughs> um, so I thought it'd be funny to include this little picture of a pregnancy test. Now that's the also how they think chytrid got spread around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these guys are resistant to the chytrid fungus, which is like wiping out a lot of frogs, right? And they're invasive in a lot of places. So they've been introduced everywhere. They're kept as pets everywhere. So these guys are <laughs> good for testing for pregnancy, not so good for all of the amphibian kind. Um, and interestingly, uh, this species of frog, although not all frogs, we'll see that in a second, um, use a different sex determination system. So it's still chromosomal, but this time it's ZW instead of XY. So why are there two different letters? Why don't they just call this XY? Same thing. It's not. And the reason it's not is because um, XY systems, the males are what's called the heterogametic sex. The males are the ones that have the two different sex chromosomes and the fem females are the ones that have the same. In ZW, the females are the heterogametic sex. So the females are the ones that have the two different sex chromosomes, right? So females are ZW in ZW systems, and males are ZZ. Does that make sense? So in specifically with uh, Xenopus labus, there is, again, this master switch gene. And it's DMW in this case, which is on the W chromosome, right, which only females have. 
And the way it works in these guys is there's a gene, DMRT1, and DMRT1 activates the male pathway, right? So DMRT1 is binding to all of these different binding sites and saying, turn on this male gene, turn on this male gene, up transcription of all these male genes. But in females, they have a DMW gene, and it turns out that DMW gene, like a rude driver, cuts off DMRT1 and binds this more strongly than DMRT1 and then doesn't upregulate anything. It just says, nope, we're not going to turn anything on at all, and you're going to stay female. Right? So it's this dominant negative, right? It's better than DMRT1 at binding, but then it doesn't, doesn't turn anything on, it doesn't upregulate anything. Okay, so that's how it works in Xenophus Levis. But it turns out, actually one of my good friends um, studies sex determination in this genus, and even within the Xenophus genus, DMW isn't used as the master switch in other species, right? So it turns out frogs are like hyper, hyper variable in their sex determination systems. Hmm. In fact, there are some genera of frogs that use ZW, some that use XY, some that use temperature sensitive sex determination, temperature dependent mm -hmm. sex determination. There's a species of frog in Japan where some populations have XY and other populations of the same species use ZW instead. So but how but how would they stay the same population? I mean I guess they're speciating early. You know, I mean, they, they, they can't even read those populations. I don't know. I'll ask them. Yeah, what actually. would happen if they did? Uh, I don't know. But they're considered the same species. You know, whether it's morphologically, they're identical. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know it must be a divergence kind of thing. thing. <laughs> or maybe they can. I don't know. Good question. I had the same question. Um, Let's go to Japan, guys. <laughs> <laughs> all the weird stuff is happening in Japan. It's true. I mean, is it the radiation? It must be. It must <laughs> be. The meltdown. Okay, so we've talked about. Four examples, right? We've talked about two mammals, an amphibian, an insect. Now let's go back to another insect, ants. So this is Solnoptis geminata, the tropical fire ant, which again occurs right up here. And uh, that's too complicated right now. So um, so far, I've talked, uh, told you guys about chromosomal sex determination, but I haven't talked about uh, sex determination via a single gene, right? So there is single gene sex determination as well, and you know that's on an autosome. There's no sex chromosomes in uh, a lot of Hymenoptera. So Hymenoptera are an order of insects. Ants, bees, and wasps are all Hymenopterans, okay? And they have, many of them, but not all of them, have what's called complementary sex determination. And um, before I explain complementary sex determination, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about haplodiploidy. And in order to talk about haplodiploidy, I'm going to have to lie to you for just a minute, okay? So just bear with me. I'm sorry in advance for the lie. So haplodiploidy is basically defined as um, uh, a phenomenon in which males result from unfertilized eggs. So that means they're haploid, right? They're not diploid. They only have one copy of every gene, not two, okay? Whereas females are the result of fertilized eggs, and they're diploid, okay? So you can think about this as males only have a mom, and females have both a mom and a dad. Okay. So on top of this haplodiploidy, which is true for most hymenoptera again, there is complementary sex determination. So complementary sex determination says, okay, there is one locus that determines sex. And it says that if you are homozygous at this locus, in other words, if you have two alleles that are the same, you're a male. If you are heterozygous, you have two different alleles, two different versions of this gene. You're female. Okay, so that means an unfertilized egg 
it's only got one allele, right? So it's, it's hemizygous is the technical term, but you could think about it as homozygous, right? It doesn't have two different versions of the allele. So it's male, right? Doesn't have, it's not heterozygous. Meanwhile, let's say the queen, we're talking just about, uh, let's just talk about ants now. The queen decides to fertilize an egg. And it's heterozygous at the sex determining locus. This time, it's female, right? So incidentally, in, in a lot of ants, bees, and wasps, queens can decide whether they want to fertilize an egg or not, right? So they have this like storage organ of sperm, and they can decide whether they want to coat the egg as it's coming through the reproductive act, uh, tract with sperm or not, right? So they can decide whether they want females or males, or so they think, because occasionally when they fertilize an egg and it's homozygous at the sex determination locus, it becomes male, right? So it's a little bit of a lie. You could have diploid males. Okay. Turns out diploid males are terrible. <laughs> they are useless. Um, they don't do any work. Actually, males in general don't do any work uh, in the hive at all, right? Yeah, how typical. Um, and, so your sex. <laughs> <laughs> and they're expensive, right? It costs the queen to make these individuals who then do no foraging for the colony at all, right? They're just sort of these like parasites. And to, to add insult to injury, they're not even passing on her genes, right? Normal males at least are like sperm vessels and they go on to like, you know, fertilize the queen and pass on the queen's genes. But these males are inviolable. They don't, they don't even make it to mate, right? They just, they just take up resources, don't do any work, and then don't pass on the genes. So they are like the worst. The worst thing. How have. are they expensive? Um, because a queen could invest that energy in making Maybe. a male that works or, or a female that does work. Okay. Right? That's a weird way of saying, but like mm -hmm. a male that functions, <laughs> that has the right, you know, stuff um, to actually be viable, oh. right? Or a female that physically does labor. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's imagine this. Let's imagine we have a mating scenario, right? Where at the sex determination locus, the queen, who is female, therefore, by definition, is heterozygous at the sex determination locus, right? So say she's got A1, A2 at this locus. Let's say she mates with a male who's haploid, right? And he has another allele, different from both of hers at the sex determination locus. So that means 50% of the offspring are going to be a product of these two gametes coming together, A1, A3, and then 50% of the time it's going to be A2, A3. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So that means all of these individuals are heterozygotes, diploids, and therefore female. So every time she fertilizes an egg, every time she decides to fertilize an egg, it's a female, it's a worker, it gets stuff done, it's awesome. Okay, meanwhile, consider this unfortunate scenario where there's a queen, by virtue of her femaleness, she, we know she's a heterozygote, A1, A2, and let's say she mates with a male who just happens to have an allele that's the same as one of hers. All right, so this male has A2 instead of A3. Terrible, terrible life decision. Okay, this is called a matched mating. The queen picked the wrong male to mate with, basically, right? Because this time, half the time, the offspring are going to be A1, A2, but the other half the time, they're going to be A2, A2. Okay, so A1, A2 is awesome, heterozygous, diploid female. A2, A2 is a homozygous diploid, which is one of these diploid males. So that means that every time she fertilizes an egg, there's a 50% chance that that offspring is going to be terrible. So she loses 50% of her workforce, just gone, right? She loses half of her workers from the gate, right? So what you end up seeing is that all of these queens, these match-mated queens in the field, are dead. You don't see them. They don't exist. So you never find these in the wild. You find them in the lab when you study them before they die, right? You just don't see them because they die too early. So this is a really interesting cost to this sex determination system, right? It means if, there, if the queen is match-mated, 50% of her workforce is going to be dead. 
Couple-oriented sex discrimination seems like a terrible idea, doesn't it? Right? It's like there's there's huge cost to the way sex discrimination works in the system. Okay. Um, well, it turns out that some species. I don't know. Go ahead. How could she, the female? I mean, since mates were paid to males, you know, for a short and then just fifty chances like wasting energy. Mm -hmm. How can she collect? Good question, right? So you would think there would be really, really strong selection pressure for them knowing what the what the sex determination allele is, but there's no evidence for that in the literature whatsoever. Nobody's ever seen that. So maybe they're choosing the right male, you know, but we don't know. We we haven't been able to detect her. that. Huh? He's not good for her. <laughs> this one definitely wasn't. wasn't but you really wonder how it works in the bottleneck that you described for the, the introduced fire ants because. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's a huge puzzle. Yeah. Um, right, it's really interesting. Uh, and they've done really well <laughs> in North America. Like, they haven't even just survived. They thrive. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so there's something weird going on. But, um, what else was I going to say? Oh, so it turns out that, you know, a lot of species have figured out sort of ways to solve this problem. So for example, honeybees, which use complementary sex determination, honeybee queens will mate multiply, right? So honeybee queens will have sperm from this male, this male, and a bunch of other males, all in her sperm organ, right? So she'll have a lot of different sex determining alleles to choose from. Does that make sense? Right? So it's not like 50% of her workforce. You'd think be. like having an organ like that, though, that would be like a place, you know, to sort where you could determine that these are not the sperm that we should, I should use or something. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, literally, the last year of my grad school career, a postdoc in one of my friend's labs, um, or one of my committee members' labs, sorry, um, uh, noticed that you do find multiple mating in, in the fire ant that I study, mm. which is really, really rare, mm. and it's only when the first mating is the matched mating. So uh, somehow they uh, know something uh, went uh, wrong, yeah. and they try again. So they can detect, yeah. So, I mean, that has a lot of implications, right? But it's like hot off the press. No one really knows what's going on. Um, but definitely a fascinating, fascinating topic, at least, at least so if you're in it. Well, I mean, that's a good question, right? Like, there is evidence for some insects can, if they mate multiply, they can, they can choose which sperm to use. Mm -hmm. So that happens, it happens in crickets, I think. Um, but I don't know whether honeybees do that. But either way, at least they have other sperm to, to, to use, right? It's not like everything they use from then on is, is you know, 50% chance of being bad. Right? Sometimes it'll be bad, sometimes it won't. At least there'll be a chance. Why on that level would any insect ever have just one, just well, one like set of sperm then? That, I mean, if there's right, the yeah. mortality Which so high, so many too. are going to be born. A great question. It seems like you would think multiple mating would, would evolve all the time. Yeah, it would just constantly happen. Sometimes you do have multiple mating, and sometimes you don't. Especially for like genetic and like the structure, right? I mean, yeah, stability it's and interesting. Then you have to is it is it advantageous for both males and females? Are they opposing maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and then there's implications for inbreeding, right? There would be like major inbreeding avoidance mechanisms. Uh, mm -hmm. like, who knows, right? Unfortunately, biological systems don't always work the way you expect them to. Right? Yeah. The short and answer to that question. Evolution isn't necessarily going to pick like the all-knowing best answer. It's right. All natural right. 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 And you don't so. know whether what you're seeing is the is even a local optimum. Right. You have no idea whether that's even a good strategy right now. You know. Um, so, okay. Let's just recap here. So I've talked about just five examples across the animal kingdom. Right. The, the point. If there's anything that you're going to take from this lecture at all, it's that sex determination is really different across a lot of different species. Okay, so just looking at vertebrates, just vertebrates, right? Placental mammals, marsupials, monotremes, snakes, lizards, tuataras, which are these weird three-eyed lizards in New Zealand, three birds. Eyes. Well, they have like this weird mm. extra white sensing organ mm. thing. It's not really an eye, but um, crocodilians, turtles, amphibians, fish, they all have different modes of sex determination. Sometimes in that same clade, they'll have a bunch of different ways of determining sex, right? So I mentioned with the turtle, uh, with the 
with the uh, frogs, there are some that have ZW, some that have XY, and actually some that have TSD. So that's kind of a typo here. There's definitely TSD, temperature, uh, dependent sex determination in, in, in frogs. Um, some of them have multiple X and Y chromosomes, like we saw with the platypus. That, that can be true for ZW as well. If we, those are the pink class, right? So there's just, just tons of <laughs> different ways that sex is determined, even just looking at vertebrates, right? So if you include insects, it's even crazier. If you include other kingdoms of life, it gets even crazier, right? So fungi, for example, have mating types. So that would be like, you have male, you have female, you have something else, and you have something else, and you have something else. And they can all mate with each other except for themselves, right? So you have mating types. In plants, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that JP can, can talk you up about that, right? You have, you have dioecious plants, right? So you have trees that can be just male and just female. And you have monoecious plants that yeah, will have both, huh? Yeah, I know dioecious plants. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> where, you have, uh, where, where it starts out as? Population that it has mm -hmm. and, and just flowers. females. It's like every permutation. Yeah, and just yeah. cereal. Exactly. And then you have some plants that like will just have male flowers first and then female flowers Thanks. second. Thank right? And then you have self incompatibility on the side where they'll they'll self, but then nothing will that that selfing event won't have been fruitful because yeah. it'll be incompatible. Just every permutation of sex determination. So it shows the incredible advantage that we have having sexual reproduction. Yeah, so so have we talked about that, or why sex in general? We've talked about that and sex with time. Okay, so you guys have talked about that. Have you all talked about Mueller's ratchet? Uh, no, I don't think we did. So Mueller's ratchet is the idea that if you have an asexual lineage... I actually know it, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> I took genetics. <laughs> um, but they might. Yeah, I don't know what that is. So let's say that you're a bacterium, right, and you have a genome and you're having, you know, mutations all the time, but you're cloning yourself. That's, that's what bacteria do, right? So they're asexual, ignoring the bacterial sex that sometimes happens. But, um, uh, if there's a mutation somewhere along that lineage, every daughter cell, every daughter bacterium from then on is going to have that mutation as well, right? So that mutation is never going to escape that line. Because it's just making copy, 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 copy. Exactly, right? So, you know, if you imagine making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, eventually that's going to be a really bad photocopy. <laughs> that's how it works with bacteria, too, right? If they just, if they just had asexual reproduction from, from beginning to end, they would, they would go extinct, right? Asexuality is a bad idea because they're accumulating all these terrible mutations. Mm -hmm. and but just, they can't just, change. But they can't get rid of, yeah. Right, so that's one disadvantage. So how does the temperature... One. I mean, very briefly, how does it work? Or, That's know? the one I researched the least, uh -huh. but I think the idea is just that at certain temperatures, one one sex-specific pathway mm -hmm. is turned on versus another. So do they, I wonder what kind of ratios they end up with. Like, are they typically really, like, in a local area? Are they scared, you know? Yeah, it's really, and like, how is climate change going to affect them? Yeah, it's actually yeah. affecting a lot of animals right now because climate change is really skewing them, like, you know, the female ratio. Mm -hmm. so yeah, like turtles and stuff. Yeah. yeah. When they tried to like save all the turtle eggs oh, yeah, and they made a whole bunch male. of males. Yeah. 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 And that's like the worst that you could do. It would be better to make more. I mean, there's always going to be enough sperm yeah. in the world, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, it's true. It's she says it's just true. recently. <laughs> what? It's true. You see female bias sex ratios a lot more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, in in so dioecious plants, it's, they tend to be male, not universally, but they're often male biased because 